Alright, so let's talk about why bother with formal design. So it's a design course, which is excellent, because that's what I'm here for. Hopefully that's what you're for. Why? What don't you know about design? I mean, have you ever designed anything before? You done projects? Yes. Big assignments? Large homeworks? You've done that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. How'd that go for you? Great. Pass the cap, class, get an A, whatever, you know, get passing grade, right? Let's just go with that. Did you get passing grade? Yes. So, so there you go. You know how to design stuff. We're done. Thank you very much. Hmm. Now, if there's a design course, there's probably a reason for it, right? So, you know, I love the Nike logo, just do it, which is sort of our approach to a lot of things in life. But if we're going to talk about design, there must be a reason that people have this whole, hey, you got to work out a design. Oh, by the way, there's a whole formal design process, all that sort of stuff like that. There has to be a reason for it. And we may as well all agree on exactly what that reason is. There has to be a motivation for it. So there's actually a couple of different reasons. There's all sorts of reasons, but there's probably two that are the most critical. First off, most of the problems that people will pay you to work on are big, complicated problems. The problems you've dealt with in the past, you know, honest, they were child problems. They were just throwaway projects. They were interesting things to make sure that you learned some concept or something like that. You got it done, you turned it in, you walked away, you never saw it again. People will pay you to solve problems that go into larger things that get sold to people, that people <coughs> use, that people depend on. Okay? So it's a much bigger deal than anything that you've ever done in the past. So a, des a formal design process does two things. First off, it formalizes the process. And I can, I can almost hear the artist inside of you screaming at this point in time. My designs are fantastic and they, they just cannot be limited by some sort of formal process. They really need to be free. Well, which is fantastic and you know, I salute the artist and stuff like that. But the reason that we formalize the design process is because if we don't, you're going to screw up. You're, anybody ever go on a vacation? Anybody ever go on a vacation? Quickly show of hand. All right, all right, that's cool. So you're going to go on a vacation. Let's say it's a faraway vacation. What do you do before you leave the house? What's the first, what do you have to do when you go on a vacation? You got to pack, right? And if you're going someplace, and let's say it's for a series of days, you got to remember to pack a whole bunch of stuff, right? Have you ever forgotten something? Is there a huge industry built on, you know, people coming, hey, to Florida and having forgotten sunscreen, razors, soap, all that sort of stuff like that. And the reason is, is because they didn't have a formal process for packing their, their luggage, right? Is that that big of a deal if you forget something when you go on vacation? Not really. What do you end up doing? You go out and buy something or borrow something or do something like that. Well, you know, if you're designing a life-critical system, or a mission critical system, you really can't forget something, right? Uh, I was working on the F-A-18 fighter jet at one point in time. The way it works on a fighter jet is, you know, they have things called pylons, which is where you stick things on the wings, like bombs or pods. And the way they do it so they can fit more bombs on a wing, they have uh, basically a holder. It holds four, five, or six bombs. <coughs> they plug it onto the wing, you fly, and then you can drop the bombs individually. Okay, so it means that a single fighter jet can carry a whole bunch of bombs. Fantastic! They had a new bomb that they were testing, so they were flying over the test range. Pilot lined everything up, got it exactly on mark, and he hit the button. And what happened was it wasn't the bomb that left, but it was the bomb holder. The thing with all six bombs on it just fell off the airplane. Which, first off, wasn't supposed to happen. And secondly, it turns out if you're flying an airplane and you lose 2,000 pounds of ordnance off of one wing, what's going to happen to that airplane? It's going to start to tumble, right? Because <laughs> now you're unbalanced. That pilot had some serious work to do for about 15 seconds immediately after he did that. And what was it? Well, somebody had screwed up on their design. 
And if he did a sequence of things in the right sequence, instead of releasing the bomb, what he said was, oh, let's try to jettison the whole shooting match. Okay? And that was a very bad thing. They made a design error, which can happen. But if you have a formal process, the hopeful, is, the hopeful the thought is, is that you won't forget things. You won't skip things. Okay? So it's there basically to cover your butt. Right? Okay, second reason that we have a formal de uh, design process is generally speaking, you're not going to be doing designs by yourself. Remember, these are big problems that you're dealing with. There's more than one person who's going to have to work on it. Oh, that's great. Well, where are you going to be located? You know, if there you'd be in an office someplace. Where's the rest of your design team going to be located? Are they going to be down the hall? 21st century guys, there's a good chance they're in a different country, they're in a different time zone, they speak a different language. Okay? So you're going to need to be able to say, hey, listen, I have made some decisions on my design. I've decided it's going to work this way. Which is fine, you're more than welcome to do that. But if you're going to do that, you best be telling somebody that you made that decision, right? Well, if you have a formal design process, and all of a sudden it allows you to synchronize with the other people on your team. Okay? It allows you to communicate to everybody else the design decisions that you've made. And probably, just as important, they can tell you what they've decided. Because if you don't have this going on, you're going to have a mess on your hands real soon. Alright, so here's the other interesting thing. If you don't take the time to come up with a formal design, in the end, it's going to end up costing you big time. Our folks, uh, some folks at Microsoft put this one together, and I think it's actually a pretty good graph. What it shows is, you know, sort of <laughs> good team, bad team, team red, team blue. Team red says, screw it, we don't need no formal design. I think you guys know what we're going to do. Everyone just get cranking on it, right? And so they do get cranking on it. So this is time and this is cost. And everything's fine for a while, but you can see as you get farther out into the project, not having a design starts to become a lot more expensive. And the reason is because is everybody's spending a lot of time talking with each other going, oh, that's what you meant? Oh, like, you did that? Because i got to go back and change my stuff because I didn't realize that you were going to do that. Or, oh, we forgot to do that. Got to go back and do it. Remember, the farther you get into a project, the more it's going to cost you to make a change. Uh, so now, the good team, the blue team, who actually took the time to come up with a formal design early on, it was more expensive early on. Right? They didn't make as much progress. But you can see over time, it's the way to do it. Right? Because they had better coordination among the team. Everybody knew what was going on. An interesting thing, and something that doesn't necessarily jump out at you right off the bat is, you know, for a short project, for a quick project, for a small project, is it worthwhile to do a, a big hunk and formal design for it? No. Not really. In fact, it could be overkill, right? You know, you might mentally run through the same steps, which is actually a, generally a good idea to do. But, you know, to do all of the overhead and all the, uh, all the other sorts of stuff that goes along with the formal design project, you know, if the project's short enough or if it doesn't matter, if you're only going to use something for like a week or a month or something like that, get it done and get it done quickly and move on, right? Don't burden yourself with a lot of extra overhead associated with it. But you need to make that call. And <laughs> yeah, the challenge with this is more often than not in life, something that you only plan on using for like a little short period of time ends up having a very long life. So you always have to be careful about that. So do some judgment calls right off the bat, but that's something you need to think about. Oh, goodness. All right, so it's story time. Man, I've been looking forward to this for so long. All right, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to change your life. And I apologize for that right off, right off the bat, but that's okay. Okay? I'm going to share a story with you. It's a great story. Well, it's at least a fairly interesting story. Okay? I want you to memorize the story. Don't bother writing it down because it's going to go so fast you're not going to be able to write it down. Instead, listen to me. I want you to picture everything I'm going to tell you. It's going to sink into your brain. When you're going to bed tonight, you're going to be thinking about the story. Tomorrow morning when you get up, the story's going to be sitting right there. You couldn't push it out of your brain if you wanted to. And since I'm the person who's making up the midterm, and I'm the person who's making up the final, if I really like the story, 
it's entirely possible the story might show up on either one of those tests. All right? You understand what we're doing here? Are you ready for the story? We're ready. All right, cool. You got to stand up. Everybody has to stand up. And this might sound crazy, and I'm cool with that, but just stick with me on this, okay? So here's how the story starts. I want you to stand there and I want you to look at your feet. I want you to look down at your feet. You're not wearing any shoes. You have to picture this, okay? Use your imagination. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Picture what your feet normally look like. You're looking at your feet. What's interesting about your feet is that you have your IDs stuck in between your toes. You've got your university ID, you've got your driver's license, you've got your social security card. They're stuck in between your toes and they're shoved all the way back. Can you feel what that would feel like? That's just wrong. You're not supposed to put stuff between your toes, but you have those lined up in between your toes. Can you see it in your mind's eye? Okay, cool. Now I want you to look at your shins. Look at your shins. You're getting a tattoo applied to your shins. It's the Google logo. They've already filled in the big yellow G, and now apparently somebody's getting ready to fill in the O. And doggone it, if you've never had a tattoo in your life, this hurts like heck. But you can see that they've done the outline of the rest of it, and they're getting ready to fill in the whole Google logo as a tattoo on your shin. Can you see that? Can you picture it? Man, you're going to have a tough story to tell mom when you come home. I don't know where that tattoo came from. All right, now why don't you look at your knees. Do you see your knees? On your knees, there's a very small person. He's a judge. He's like one of those classic English judges. He's got the, like, the white wig thing, okay? And he's got one of those judge gavels, you know, the judge that they always talk. And he's banging on your knee. You've got a little judge person with a big white wig banging on your knee. Can you see this on your knee? All right, after this, I want you to take a look at your thighs. On your thighs, you've got one of those tennis ball cannon things. You know, the ones that all the professionals use to practice. It shoots tennis balls out, but it's not actually shooting tennis balls. It's shooting little letter C's. Sometimes it's a capital C, sometimes it's a lowercase c. But it's shooting little letter C's out. In fact, it's shooting at the judge who has to keep ducking as all these little letter C's keep flying over them. Okay, can you see that? Can you see the tennis ball cannons on your thighs? You gotta look, gotta look, gotta picture it. All right, now we're up to your waist. On your waist is Lady Gaga, a little miniature Lady Gaga. Stay with me here, kids, stay with me. She's wearing, she's wearing the meat dress. You guys know about the meat dress, right? A dress completely made out of meat, which would be fine if it wasn't for the dogs. There are two dogs chasing her. She's running around your waist. The dogs are running after her and she's wearing those ridiculous high heel shoes. My God, she's not going to be able to stay away from them because those dogs, they smell meat. Okay. Can you see that? All right, we're halfway through the story. Do we need to review it? Do we need to go over it one more time make sure? All right, we're looking at your toes. You've got your IDs. You've got your student ID. You've got your driver's license. You've got your social security card. They're stuck in between your toes. They're shoved all the way back. You know exactly what that feels like. Number two, somebody's putting the Google logo on your shins. They filled in the G, they're starting to work on the O, and it hurts like heck. All right. Now we're looking at your knees. On your knees, there's a little judge. He's got the white wig, he's got the little gavel thing. He's wailing away on your kneecap. Boy, that's got to hurt. On your thigh, we've got the tennis cannon, one of those little tennis things that shows. But it's not shooting tennis balls, is it? It's shooting something else. What's it shooting? C's. Little, little C's, big C's, that's right. Now we're up to your waist, and on your waist, what do we have? Who's there? Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga wearing what? What's she wearing? Mean dress. dress. And what's chasing her? A couple of dogs. Okay, fabulous. All right. <laughs> now the most amazing thing has happened. Somebody's actually made a perfect replicable model of your backside out of Legos, and they've attached it to your backside. <coughs> you can reach back there, you can feel it. You know what Legos feel like, right? That. So you have a model of your rear end made out of Legos and it's been attached to you. It's the weirdest, strangest thing. You have no idea how this has happened, but somehow it's happened. Now I'm looking at your back. We've replaced each one of the discs in your back. And you know what discs in the back are. Those are the little bony things, right? We've replaced each one of those with an electrical outlet, a little plug-in electrical outlet. And somebody is in the process of putting extension cords into your, this is like a bad Matrix movie or something like that. Plug in electrical outlet cords into your back. What, 24, 26, whatever. Man, you were like a walking power supply at this particular point in time. Can you see that? Can you see those getting plugged into your back? Fantastic. Okay. Now I want you to think about your shoulders. Touch your shoulders. Everybody touch your shoulders. 
On your shoulders, there's like a little school desk, and there's a little student who's taking a test, and it's not going well. It must be a math test, right? Okay, And you can tell it's not going well because they're scribbling on a piece of paper, and then they'll get all frustrated, and they'll wad up the paper, and they'll throw it. And there's a big pile of paper building up all around them. Can you, can you see that? Fantastic. We're almost there. Stick with me on this, and trust me, there's a reason for all this. All right, I want you to picture your face. You can see your face. Okay, You open your mouth, you stick your tongue out, and there's a perfect little baby on your tongue. There's a little baby. And then all of a sudden, a stork comes along, grabs the baby, and takes it away. You shut your mouth, and you stick your tongue out again, and there's another perfect little baby on your tongue. And another stork comes along and takes it and flies away. Last one, last part to my story. We're standing there, we're looking at you, and a hammer comes flying out of the top of your head, which is odd, but then there's screwdrivers flying out of the top of your head, pliers coming out of the top of your head, reciprocating saws, I mean, all sorts of tools. You're like a tool fountain. Got that picture? Sit down. Well, now, that was the story, wasn't it? Let's see if we can do the whole story, okay? You ready? All right, so I'm looking at your toes. What do I see on your toes? Okay, all right. I'm looking at your shins. What do I see? Excellent. Yellow jeans. Big, loud, big. Yeah, can you see that? Man, that's got to hurt to have that one. All right, I'm looking at your knees. Judge, what you doing? He's got to stop doing that. Cool, now I'm looking at your thighs. Shooting a what? C's. Little C's. Big C's, little C's. Cool, that's obvious. I'm looking at your waist. And why are the dogs chasing her? She's wearing the poor toys. All right. Something's been affixed here behind. What is it? It's a perfect label. Your spine looks a little different. Why does your spine look a little different? All this. And can you, can you see the, the extension cords being plugged into your back? Yeah. You're walking power supply you. What's going on on your shoulders? Yeah, it's not going well, is it? Not going well. All right, I'm looking at your face. What's happening? Your tongue has baby babies. It does. And then what happens when the baby shows up? Yeah, it's gone, right? Okay, last thing, last thing. What am I looking at? New tools. And what's happening with the tools? They're flinging out of your head. They don't even let you in lows anymore because you're just leaving a big pile of tools behind you. All right, everybody, big round of applause, guys. Thank you very much. You have no idea why you did that, but you did an excellent job of it, so I greatly appreciate that. All right, so now let's talk about the elements of the design process, shall we? So this is the formal design process. There are a lot of different ways to do design. There's a lot of different ways you can combine things. You don't necessarily have to do it all in sequence and stuff like that. But consider this to be the big picture, okay? This is the kind of stuff I personally would love to put on a midterm. Can you tell me the 10 components of, a, of the design process? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, man. Now I'm going to have to memorize that. That's going to be a pain in the butt. But the good news is you already got this taken care of. You've already got this 10-step process taken care of. It's locked in your brain. In fact, you could not forget this 10-step engineering design process if you tried it at this particular point in time. Should we take a look and understand why you know what's going on? Well, what's the very first step of the process? It's called what? Problem ID. Oh, problem ID. ID. Huh, well, I'm looking at my toes. What's stuck in between my toes? Oh, how interesting. Oh, well, I'm just saying there might be a little correlation there. Whatever, it's your call. Second step is what? Research phase. Research phase. Hey, if I was going to research something, where would I go first? Google. I'd go Google it, right? Which is handy because i got apparently a big tattoo on my shin, right? That should be pretty easy to remember that one. Third phase is what? <coughs> requirement specification. So requirements is sort of like having somebody tell us what to do, right? You're required to do this, which really sort of, at least in my book, reminds me of like the law, right? Because I have to do what the law tells me to do. And who's in charge of the law, ultimately? A judge, right? All right so that's a little bit of a reach, but I'm, I'm on with there. All right, so the next step is concept generation. So that's where you're coming up with ideas, right? Kicking them out, so to speak. And concept begins with what letter? C. Little C, big C. Shooting at you. Got lots of lots of concepts coming at you. All right, that's fine. After concept generation comes what? What's the next step? Design. Design. Lady Gaga. Design, Lady Gaga. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't even matter what you think of Lady Gaga. She's got a lot of design going on there, right? She's all about the design. 
All right, so after we get that done, we go uh, prototype and construction. Building a perfect model of your what? Backside? All right, all right, all right, we're good at that. After prototype and construction, we move on to what's called system integration, which is basically bringing two things together. And in our story, where did we bring two things together? It was spine in and out, right? We're plugging it in, matrix moment, right there. After system integration, we go on to system test. Oh, man. Takes you back to school when you have to take tests, right? A little frustrating. Be writing on a piece of paper, it wouldn't be going well, wad it up, create a big pile. All right, all right, that's all good. After system test, we go to delivery and acceptance, right? Delivery, as in like little babies being delivered, and acceptance as in a stork coming along, grabbing the baby, and taking off, right? And then our final phase is maintenance, where you take care of your design, where you update your design, where you take care of all that sort of stuff, correct? Uh, maintenance is almost like you use tools for maintenance, right? Well, coincidentally, if you turn yourself into a tool fountain, you'll never be without a tool. All right. Does the story make a little bit more sense now? Good morning. No. No. Fabulous. If it made sense, you'd never remember it. If it makes no sense whatsoever, you can't get it out of your mind. A week, a month, a year from now, I could come back to you and say, hey, look, I'm thinking of Lady Gaga. I keep it on the back. Are there dogs there? Fantastic. All right, so I've shared with you the 10 steps in the design process, which is a fantastic and a wonderful thing, but if, that's it. It's just going to lay there. If we don't do anything with it, it's never going to stick in your brain. So what we need to do is we need to work together, okay? I know your brain may or may not be warmed up yet, but we're going to get you warmed up now because we're going to deal with a critical problem that's facing society. It's not hunger. It's not electrification of uh, first world countries. Though the other really smart people are handling that stuff. Instead, we're going to handle a problem that's a lot closer to home, and in, our, in, in all honesty, is probably more of a critical problem. Okay? It's bikers who want to drink coffee. Okay? A critical issue, so, uh, something that's begging for a solution, and I need your assistance in coming up with a solution for this. Because clearly, this is not a good solution. Grabbing the mug and going. Look, come on, that's biking with one hand. That's not going to do anybody any good. All right, so let's see what we can do here. So we have a 10-step process. What's the very first step in the design process? That is, that's those ID cards stuck in the code, right? Okay, yes, that's exactly correct. All right, so problem identification. So what we really want to do is figure out what the customer needs are, can occur in a variety of ways, and we need to determine the true needs. So when we talk about our biker and coffee problem, what's the true need? Have a whole night screen. Both hands, why is that important? I have better control. So we've got text. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no biking and text. But yeah, all right, so, so if you're holding a coffee cup, you can have a bit of a problem because you got, are there any other issues besides say Spill the coffee. Spill the coffee on yourself, so you get to wherever you're going and you're trash. Anything else? Spill the coffee on the ground. Well, if I spent four bucks on that coffee, I sure as heck don't want to be wasting on it. That's a good one. What else we got? Keep the coffee warm. Keep the, you know, yeah. I mean, if you're sitting there holding it, you got wind blowing over the top, that's got to be sucking the heat out of it, right? I mean, it's a, maybe not a huge issue, but it's an issue. What else? Hey, you don't want your balance thrown off by the extra weight of the loop. <laughs> Depending on how much coffee you have, that's exactly right. That could be a huge issue. Gotcha. And, you know, I guess maybe you'd be making poor decisions, right? You get into a situation, you're thinking about the coffee first, right? You know. That's why you're hitting the pedestrians. All right, so you know, there's a lot of, uh, I guess there's a lot of different things. It's not just holding the coffee, but there's a lot of different things. All right, so that's cool. What's the second step in the design process? Research. 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 All right, we've got to do a research. All right, well, this is cool. So we're, because we're committed to solving this problem, we're going to jump on this one, and we're going to go out, and we're going to solve the research part of the problem. All right, so how are you going to, how are you going to research this particular problem? Google it. You could Google it. What's a better way to do it? Go out and ask them. See go out and ask them. Let's go one step farther. Get some coffee and get on a bike, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not that hard, right? So we're, we want to become uh, an expert on this particular technology. That's cool. It's the coffee bike technology that we're on here. Don't reinvent the wheel. Is it possible there's already a solution to this? And how much time should we spend trying to solve a problem that's already solved? Zero, right? But, but yeah, that's, you know, and that's always a possibility, right? Well, what that would mean is that, yeah, there's a solution, but clearly 
It's not one that's needed in everybody's needs, right? Huh? A duct tape might be a solution in this one, but it might not be the ideal solution, okay? Uh, you want to be new and innovative solutions, which goes right along with what you were saying, right? Congratulations, you got a solution, but let's get a little bit innovative. All right, so you're there. So how would you actually research this problem? What would you have to do? Okay, so we're talking about you, we're talking about how we're talking about a bike. But is it just getting on a bike and ride around? Observation. Observation, that's cool. Are you going to have to test some parameters? What kind of parameters would you have to test? Excellent. And what kind of bike will you be riding? A terrain you're riding. A terrain. That's interesting. I mean, if you think you got to be on one of those little uh, sport dual wheelie bikes, you know, like, yeah, you know, uh, uh, and then maybe like one of the fancy, I'm Lance Armstrong, I can go really fast with a super skinny tire type. You know, there's different types of bikes, right? And then terrain, terrain's an issue. Do uphill, downhill, bumpy, that type of deal. Uh, do, should we try different types of bikers? Bikers come in different sizes, right? Small, big, small, all that sort of stuff like that. Should we run through all those types of things? What else would we have to try as far as the parameters? Just because we're trying to collect data here, right? Different sizes of coffee or sizes of coffee. Right, mugs, basically, right? Small, medium, or grande, <laughs> or whatever the, the correct word. Oh, yeah, okay. So we have to say, and what we're doing is we're collecting data, right? We're going to find out if we've got some issues and stuff like that. All right, research phase. What comes after the research phase? Requirements phase. All right. So this is our requirement specification. Okay. This is you know here's this is the key thing. Requirements are going to guide the entire project. So as we talk with other people, they're going to say, Hey, what are you working on? You're going to say, Well, I'm coming up with a better way to for bikers to have coffee. They'll say, Fantastic. If you want to share with them your description of the problem, it's not going to be you verbally telling them. Right? Nobody's got time for that. Instead, you'll hand them a requirements document and say, Here are the requirements for what's going on. Here's the key thing, and this is, you know, if you take nothing else away from this class, take this away, okay? How do you know it's a requirement? You know it's a requirement because it has the word shall in it. The coffee shall not spill. The coffee shall stay warm. The coffee shall not cause the biker to crash. Right? You know, so that's the type of terminology that we're talking about. What we're not talking about is how we're going to implement it, okay? I'm going to come up with a holder that's going to be bolted to the... No, 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 no. Don't care about that. I'm going to come up with a solution that holds coffee so that the biker can bike with both hands on the handlebar. Fantastic. That's wonderful. That's great. That's a requirement. Not how I'm going to solve it. It's rather what problem I'm actually going to solve. All right? Oh, I'm sorry. What's next? After requirements, what comes next? Design. Concepts. Okay, so let's see. We figured requirements was the judge, and what would come after the judge, which was at our knees? The cannons. The cannons, and they're shooting out little what? Which would stand for? There we go. Fantastic. See, I got you. It's stuck in your brain. All right. Concept generation. What do you think? I made this one myself. I'm sort of proud of it a little bit. Okay. Yes. That's what I was saying. And then this is. Uh, anybody a biker in here? You know, there's a, like a water backpack that you can have. You know, that. Just think if you took the water out and put coffee in it. That would be fantastic. Yeah, well, that's true. That's that. Concepts. We're in concepts here. Let's not be like limited by anything. That comes later. All right. Okay, so what we're trying to do here, you know, wild creativity is encouraged. This is really the time that you want to dream and dream big. So Mr. Naysayer over there says that a backpack's going to burn your back. Well, whatever, okay? It's still a concept, right? We can solve any problems there are. But you can see what we're trying to do is, is just dream at this point in time. Let's not limit ourselves by what can or can't be done. Let's not limit ourselves by what's been done in the past. You know, this is a great time to think about the iPod team, right? When they're coming up with the original iPod, they sure didn't think, well, I don't know, where's the cassette tape going to go? You know, we ought to have a place for that, right? Instead, what they said was, look, what do we really want to do? Clearly, they were thinking big terms of it. Um, ultimately, it's going to get tempered by reality. Cost, price, delivery time, all that. We'll work all that in. But here, we want to just come up with every idea that we possibly can think of. And after that, we'll worry about sorting it out. All right, what comes after concept generation? Design. Design. The Lady Gaga page, right? All right, fantastic. All right, so what we're going to be doing here is we're actually going to be 
trying to test out different parts of the concepts that we've selected to move forward with, right? Now, the gist on this one is, is we'll probably test out different parts of it. Uh, we won't necessarily be using the final materials for whatever the, the particular design is, but what we may be doing is testing out the overall concept. What we want to do is find out if there's a hole in the idea that we're playing around with, okay? In this particular case, we might come up with, you know, how should we attach a holder to the bike? A lot of different ways to do that. Let's run through a bunch of different ways to do it. And then, you know, after that, how should we hold the cup? Is there a good way? Is there a bad way? Et cetera, et cetera. All right? What comes after design? Prototypes. All right, so now we're going to do prototypes. Many prototypes are discarded and are modified as the system evolves. This is so hard for engineers, okay? So the concept with prototype is you go in and you say, listen, I'm going to try a bunch of things out. I need to understand a bunch of things aren't going to work. And it's not a reflection on me. I'm still a good person, all that sort of stuff like that. The thing is, is that you're running through a bunch of ideas and you're trying to eject the ones that aren't any good so you can find the best fit. Because remember, there will be multiple solutions that work, right? What you're really trying to find is the optimal solution, the one that works best for your customer, for you, for the problem. Okay? Uh, different elements of the system are constructed and tested. What you're really starting to do is you're starting to bring the different parts together. Experiment, demonstrate proof of concepts, and improve your understanding of what's going on. That's what's going on here. You've got a concept, you've narrowed it down to a set of concepts, you're actually doing some design, you're doing some implementation. As you're welding or fabricating or putting it together, you go, oh man, that's not going to work for a variety of reasons. Maybe the material that you're building it out of just isn't available. Or maybe it's too wickedly expensive. You know, a lot of things like that can happen. All right, prototype and construction, what comes after that? System integration. System integration. All right, up and down the back, spine, all that sort of stuff like that. All right, so here we go. So now what we're doing is if you have different parts to the design in your professional careers, this is where you're bringing your part of the design together with everybody else's. And you're fitting them together and seeing if together they're actually going to work together. This is a mess. It's absolutely horrible. It, it can be just you know, terrible. If you've got a good design process, if everybody's been communicating, with a little luck it will come together. But this is going to take a fair amount of effort no matter what. Okay, clear communication in the design phase will help with the system integration. Amen to that. But it is a learning experience. You have to understand how that one goes. Closely tied to the test phase. All right. So after system integration, what are we going to do? System test. System test. There we go. All right. So <laughs> we think we've got a great idea. We've built our design. We've come out. We're going to give it to our customers and have them go out and give it a shot. In this particular case, perhaps our putting the flashing lights on the uh, glowing cup lid or whatever wasn't the best idea because it's distracting uh, the customer. So maybe we'll have to go back. Do you think that we'll have to go from system test, maybe back to design, to make some changes? We would expect to have to do that sort of stuff. Cool. What comes after system test? Ah, there we go. That's right. It's delivery and acceptance, isn't it? Right. That's where we give it to the customers. We come to them and we say, listen, we've got this fantastic sort of like holder thing and it's got a gizmo so it'll always be perfectly level as we go along. And Man, you know, and it's only $200. So, I mean, my God, you know, we've solved your coffee bike problem for you right there, right? So they have to do acceptance testing. So no matter how good we think our design is, who's the ultimate judge? Gotcha, right? So we'll turn it over to them and what will they do? Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> good chance on that one. So in the real, you know, unlike going to Best Buy and just picking something off the counter, checking out and going home and saying, "Got this done." In the real world, if somebody's asked you to do something, to build something, to design something, what's going to happen is you're going to show up with your design, and they're going to say, "Well, let's take a look at it." They're not going to pay you <coughs> until they've completed their acceptance testing. I did a lot of work with the military. The military is people who do nothing but acceptance testing. Right? I mean, that is their career in the military. So the contractor delivers the product that's been asked for, and these people have tests, because they've written the tests, right? They say, well, here was the requirement, here's the test, here's your product. We're going to step through each one of these and make sure that your product does exactly what we told you to do. And by the way, at the end of that testing, then we're going to write you a check. 
but we're not going to write you a check before that. So it's a huge, a huge endeavor. All right, what comes after delivery and acceptance? That is exactly correct. All right, so the product's going to get out there. People are going to use it. They're going to use it in ways that you hadn't anticipated, <coughs> right? And it will probably wear, tear, all sorts of stuff like that. At that point in time, probably you'll end up going back and doing redesign or fixing. You know, if you've delivered a particle accelerator, there's not too many people who want particle <coughs> accelerators, but if it breaks down, it will come back to you to fix because there's not that many places you can take particle accelerators to get fixed, right? So a lot of different things can go on there. So that's the last phase. Are there any questions? Don't things kind of just, uh, like in, where I work, they all kind of go on at the same time. Right. It's not really a linear process. You are exactly correct. And in fact, they don't necessarily go on in this linear process, right? You can skip from this step back to this step to, you can do this, all sorts of stuff like well, that. Well, there's so many components that go into the end product that there's so many parts of the design that you have to start testing each one each anyway. Exactly, right, exactly. And you're exactly correct. This is a very simplified presentation, right? And it's also very linear. Okay, what I want you to do is understand the steps. I want you to understand how the steps fit together. We'll get into the other stuff as we go along, but you're exactly right. In the real world, it's a little bit more chaotic than this, and potentially a lot more chaotic than this. And especially if you have a complex system, potentially you have different parts of the system going through different stages at different parts. Also, if you have a product that has multiple releases, version one, version two, version three, you know, you may, it jumbles it up even more. So that's why there's a bunch of people who have a fine career called project managers, right? Because it's their job to keep track of all that garbage. All right, good? Any other questions? All right, you see how the story helps you flow through this? Thank you, Lady Gaga. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Honor. All good. All right, you got to be flexible in your design. Ultimately, that's the takeaway from this. Because remember, you're always going to be changing things. You're always going to be discovering new information. Your customer's going to go, oh yeah, there's one more thing. Forgot to tell you, it has to be blue. It has to be purple. It has to fit into a space that's big. They don't always stick the things right off the bat. Oh, should we spend a little bit of time talking about ethics? Because we don't really know what ethics are, but it seems like it's fairly important. Goodness gracious, the university thinks it's pretty important. Remember, what did we say about ethics? It's extraordinarily boring. It's a very dry topic. Right up until the day you are going to jail. Right. Okay. At that point in time, you're very interested in ethics. And you really, really, really wish you paid more attention to what was going on. All right, so let's get this discussion started. So you go, well, ethics doesn't really affect me. Well, interesting enough, ethics does affect you. And in fact, there's some folks at Southwest Airlines that really wish that they had taken a course on ethics because they cost Southwest $7.5 million because of a lapse in ethics. Now watch how this one happens. Because remember, do, do ethical issues show up with a big flashing arrow? Let's say this is an ethical issue. One of those things that mom and dad talk. Did your parents have a talk with you about ethics? I mean, they had a whole bunch of talks with you. But did they have a talk with you about ethics? Yes. All the time? <laughs> yes. When I see dad in jail, he says, hey, son, OK, yeah. Uh, you see, we don't really talk about this because nobody really knows what to talk about. All right, so anyway, at Southwest Airlines, here's the way it works. If you fly airplanes as part of your business, after a certain number of hours in the air, that airplane has to be grounded, taken out of service, and inspected for things like structural cracks. All right, whatever. The problem is, is while it's grounded, it's not making money for the airline. And those inspections take a while to do. And they're expensive because you have to have a specialist and special machinery. And so if you have a bunch of airplanes that go out of service at the same time, they're going to sort of line up while you inspect each one and get sign off and all that sort of stuff like that. It's expensive. So the FAA has people who do nothing but basically monitor and do these sorts of inspections. No problems with that whatsoever. There was a bunch of folks who worked for the FAA in this job, in charge of inspections, who retired from the FAA. Guess who they went to work for? Southwest Airlines. Well, I mean, who else is going to hire you when you get that very specialized? So now this guy that you worked side by side with for 20 or 25 years, all of a sudden leaves the FAA, where you're working, and goes to work for Southwest Airlines. You know, he's still Fred. He's still in town. He's still going out to lunch. It's all still cool. Time goes on, 
They've got some airplanes that slide out. They're sitting in a queue waiting to be inspected. He comes to you and says, listen, you know, we're going to inspect this airplane. There's no problems with that like we've inspected it a hundred times before. But I'll tell you what, what we're going to do is we're going to just put it off a little bit. We're going to inspect it like next month because we've got this big lineup of other airplanes that need to be inspected. So it's going to be flying. We're going to bring it back in a month and we'll be good to go. And you go, okay, let's go for lunch, man. No problem, right? So what Southwest did was they flew 46, I think it is, of their airplanes that had not been inspected when they needed to be inspected. And the reason that this happened was because the Southwest Airlines inspection people were chummy with the FAA because they worked with them forever and ever and ever and ever, right? So the FAA guys let Southwest slide on their inspection. Well, where'd that come from? And you know, it saved Southwest hundreds of millions of dollars because those airplanes were in service, they could sell tickets, they could fly from here to there, they made a zillion dollars. Turns out, <laughs> I guess they probably made $7.5 million because that's how big the fine was. Okay? Did they put people at risk? Yeah, those airplanes have to be inspected. Did anything bad happen? No. Did we get lucky on that? Yeah, probably. So that's an ethical lapse. Somebody made a bad ethical decision. Was there any flashing sign? No. <coughs> it was a couple guys who were going to go out to lunch or work on some paperwork. And they decided to go out to lunch instead. And that's all there is to it. It's as simple as that. They sneak up on it. <coughs> so what is ethics? So, good question now. Is ethics what you feel? If I come into a situation, if it feels wrong, then I shouldn't do it. Because I'm in a bank and I've got a gun and they've got money. <laughs> Wait, no, hold it, this is wrong. All right. Does ethics have something to do with your religious beliefs? And pick the religion, it doesn't matter. Whatever religion you want. You know, is religion a guiding force for ethics? If you're religious, you must be ethical. If you're not religious, you must not be ethical. I don't know about that. All right. Being ethical is doing what the law requires. That simple? Follow the law and you're good, right? Break the law, go to jail because you were unethical. That seem pretty simple? If so, ethics is pretty simple, guys. Rock and roll. Book the law, do whatever it says, and you're good to go because you're ethical, right? Well, it depends what we say about law. Well, no, that's an interesting point. So what do we got? I was saying back in Germany in 1939, I made the law back then weren't really ethical, but that was a law. That's 100% correct on that. I mean, we go back to Ten Commandments, right? Well, it seems like laws is this stuff, or pick whatever laws you want, right? And if you move to a different country, that country has different laws. So do your ethics change? I kind of think would I be embarrassed to tell anyone this, and that's kind of cool. It's the front page of the New York Times, and if my mom read it there, how would I feel about it, right? Excellent. And I mean, that's like that sort of back pocket type of ethical type of thing that we do. Cool. Um, ethics consists of the standards and behaviors that our society accepts. Right? Which is sort of what you're saying there, right? If it's what everybody, you know, if that's the way we live our lives, if we do those things and we don't do those things, then it must be ethical behavior, right? These all seem pretty, or I don't know what the word means. Woohoo! And what do I got down here in the bottom? I've got logo for Worldcom. What happened to Worldcom? It did turn into Verizon. The reason it turned in is because Bernie Ebers, the guy who uh, ran it, uh, cooked the books. Woohoo! We're doing fantastic. Hey, wait, Bernie, that's not really profit. Uh, Enron, what happened to Enron? the books. <laughs> they cooked the books big time, right? Um, they did all sorts of fancy. They had a trading floor that was fake. Yeah, they sold yeah, they sold energy to people by shutting down power supplies and jacking up the rates. They did stuff with California, didn't they? They found a, a bottleneck on how um, power is provided to California and they just shoved a whole bunch of stuff through, caused it to go down and drove prices up exactly right. And our good friends at uh, Anderson Consulting, they ran a shredder when they shouldn't have ran a shredder. So once again, these are all bright, smart people. These are college-educated people who know, should have known better, but apparently they did not take this ethical class. And so these things, religion and law and all that sort of stuff like that, didn't seem to work out for them. All right, so let's see if we do this. So what is ethics? Ethics refers to standards of behavior that tell us how human beings, all humans, all young guys, human beings ought to act in the many situations in which they find themselves as friends, parents, children, citizens, business people, teachers, professionals, and so on. Standards of behavior mean it's a decision-making process. Okay, we're talking about you making a decision. Should I do this or should I do this? Should I not do this or should I do this? That's what ethics is. The challenge is that we have to teach you how to make that decision correctly. Man, I hope there's a simple way to do this, right? 
The answer is always C, right? <laughs> All right. Feelings. Maybe how we feel shows us how to be ethical. Does that sound like a fair deal? No. I mean, our parents raised us correctly, right? If it feels right, we should do it. Unfortunately, the pictures of these guys up here, uh, who is it, Jared? Remember who Jared is? He's guy with Tracy out in Arizona, shot the representatives. He really felt that that was the right thing to do. He's flaming crazy, okay? And Anders, who does have a very nice Facebook picture, by the way, he also went crazy over in Norway, right? And he did that because he thought it was the right thing to do. A person following his or her feelings may recoil from doing what's right. So what you know to be right, they may go, whoa, that is so wrong. Don't want to do that. So can we trust our feelings? No, not really. Great. You let us down on that one. So much for that silver blood. In fact, feelings frequently deviate from what's ethical. <laughs> I think I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> All right, religion. Can we hide in a religion and say, look, I'm a member of this religion, I follow the rules of this religion, so therefore I am ethical. As long as I follow what they say, I'm good to go. I, and I think that that's probably correct. The problem is, is you have to choose the right religion. <laughs> and I don't know what that is, sorry about that. All right? Ethics, do they only apply to religious people? If you're not religious, could you be ethical? Of course. Sure, okay. Religion can set a high ethical standard, provide intense motivation for ethical behaviors. Cool, that's good stuff. Hey, could you be religious and still be unethical? Yes. It's a big time, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, it's not confined to religion, nor is ethics the same as religion. So basically, religion, <laughs> great, wonderful, fantastic, but has almost nothing to do with ethics. Okay? It can provide a framework, but it's not a guarantee. All right, let's keep going. Following the law. As long as I do what the law says, I'm being ethical. Sounds pretty good, right? Drive 55. Don't throw your gun on the street. Don't shoot people. Don't rob. I'm good, right? Except for these things, right? So the American South, were there rules that today we would say, that's not ethical, right? Separate drinking fountains, separate restrooms, separate education, all sorts of stuff like that. Today we look at that and go, really? I mean, you did that? Um, apartheid in South Africa, apartheid was the law, right? They divided everybody up. They gave different people uh, different rights based on the color of their skin. I mean, that was law. You can look in the books. It was written. I mean, it wasn't just like whispered or something like that. I mean, it was legitimately on the law, on the law, and that's what the police enforced, right? So I would like to think that laws are generally pretty good, right? But it looks like we can go crazy. Is that is that's unreasonable? So apparently we can't hide and say, well, if it's up, if, we, if you're matching the law, then you're being ethical. Uh, how about doing what society says is right? I mean, if society as a whole is saying that this is something that should be done or should not be done, we should be on pretty safe ground, right? If it wasn't for the fact that Germany went crazy from 1938 to 1942, right? And what's interesting, and perhaps we'll, we'll hook some of you on this one, in our society today, there's three hot button issues. Okay, first one being abortion, second one being uh, capital punishment, and the last one being euthanasia. So where do you fall on that? Doesn't matter. You fall on one side on each one of those issues. You have an opinion as to what is right and what is wrong. Congratulations, 50% of the people think you're wrong. Right? So ethically, I think it is whatever as far as abortion. There's 50% of the people go, oh, you're being unethical. Well, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm using my feelings on this. Maybe I have some sort of justification for it. It doesn't even matter. What a mess. All right, so what is ethics? All right. So ethics is referring to some well-founded standards of right and wrong. Okay, so this is a big, big, big thing. Okay? They prescribe what humans ought to do usually in terms of obligations, benefits to society, fairness, or specific virtues. Ah, those are squishy things, man. Rights? Fairness? How the heck are you going to figure that stuff out? Oh, I see some test questions coming now. 
<laughs> so you can get those right. Oh, good luck with that. All right, secondly, ethics refers to the study and development of one's ethical standards. And this is actually probably an important thing. So your ethics, whatever they happen to be, do you think they're completely formed right now? Do you think you're as ethical as you ever will be? The answer to that is no, especially at your age. Thank you very much. So you're raw clay, basically, right? We're going to try and get you to think about ethics, to understand how ethics works, OK? But ultimately, who you are and what kind of ethical decision you make is going to be a result of how you live your life and the people that you come in contact with and the situations that you find yourself in. And you will make ethical decisions every single day of your life, OK? And those will shape you and refine you and make you the person you are. And also determine if you get to wear an attractive orange jumpsuit during the average working day or something a little bit more formal. All right. Look at this. Who knows what the IEEE is? Fantastic. Hands down. Who's a member of the IEEE? OK, congratulations. The rest of you, you realize IEEE is the professional organization for electrical engineers, right? And you want to be what when you grow up? Why would you not join the professional organization? Oh, okay, whatever. We'll talk about that later. Okay. IEEE has a code of ethics. So first off, you need to think about something here. Wait! They went to the effort of coming up with a code of ethics. There must be a reason for that. And there is. They've got interesting things here. Look at this. To reject bribery in all of its forms. <coughs> Well, yeah, okay, that seems pretty basic, but why did they bother to put it into the code of ethics? The answer is bribery shows up an awful lot. You might not realize it. Hey, I got some concert tickets. Would you, you know, I know you're working on figuring out selecting vendors, but look, they're super bold tickets, right? Okay, so it happens in a thousand different ways, okay? But anyway, they've got ten things that they worked into their code of ethics. You know, do you have a code of ethics? Do you have a code of ethics that you could refer to? If I said, hey, what's your code of ethics? Could you whip out a piece of paper right now and show me? So here's an interesting point. IEEE has a professional code of ethics. You could adopt their code of ethics as your code of ethics. You may make changes to it. You may add to it or subtract it. You can do a whole bunch of things. But you know what? This is a place for you to start. You might want to do a little Google search to find out what the IEEE Code of Ethics actually says. There's no possible way you can read this because it's way too small. Okay? But, you know, if you need a starting point in your life, in your professional life, for a Code of Ethics, the IEEE Code of Ethics, some really smart people spent some really good time working out exactly what should be and should not be on that list. It's a starting point, something for you to consider. All right. Uh, got a case study. You ready for this? This is pretty much it. We're at the tail end of the class. Okay. Just need your mind for another moment. Here's the scoop. Our friend Eric. Eric. He's graduating. Does that seem familiar to anybody? And he's in a blind panic. He's got to get a job. So what does he do? He sends out. Resume. To who? Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Desperately trying to get a job. Good news. Guess what? He gets a call. They say, Hey, Eric, would you come in for an interview? And he takes a look at who it is. He's not that interested in working for him. Who, who would you? Let's say, what, Walmart. What if Walmart calls him. He's not that interested in working for Walmart. Okay? But he goes for the interview, right? And he aces it. He does a fantastic job. And the person he's interviewing with says, Eric, you're just the kind of guy we want to have here at Walmart. I want to offer you a job. Uh-oh. Whoops. That was what happened. Quick question. What should Eric do? Should he accept the offer? What's that? Okay, so first off, what did I hear over here? He said milk it as much as you can out of it. Milk it. So accept it. And say, I've got other offers, so could you raise your offer? Okay. And you said conditionally accept it with full disclosure of his intention of looking for another job. Conditionally accept it, full disclosure that he's looking for. So exactly how would that conversation go? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you for the offer. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm just starting my interview cycle, and if I get an offer from pretty much anybody else, <laughs> I will not be accepting dating advice from you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Should he accept the job? You do not have to accept it right away. Well, now that's an interesting point, right? And we don't really have the information on that. But they might be saying, hey, you know, I've got other people waiting in the hall. 
But you know, I'm not even going to bother with them if you accept this job. Right? No matter what, they might put some time effort on it, right? You're not going to have an unlimited amount of time. All right, so any, anybody else? Should he accept that Walmart's not necessarily like a long term like, career? Ooh. Ooh. Uh, and I, it's interesting you say that. Well, like, that's not true. Like, an electrical engineering job, Walmart might just be like an interim thing. Well, here's the fact, and I understand, and that perhaps you're right. Walmart has deep pockets and does amazing things. They do all sorts of interesting things in Walmart, of course. You know, they're actually one of the leaders in uh, RIFP, the RFID tags. They're doing huge things because they buy so much stuff and they have to track so much stuff and they have to get so much stuff out to where it goes. They do a lot of fascinating things. They've got a fantastic IT department. They actually have a fantastic disaster recovery organization. Because whenever there's something bad that happens, like the circuit that goes through, Walmart always gets hit, right? So they've got a lot of people doing a lot of things.